going to turn to a conversation, and this feels you know, like a great conversation to have after talking to Alice, about reimagining the idea of conventional agriculture. So I'd like to introduce Caitlin Liebert, who is the Vice President of Sustainability for Whole Foods Market, and someone I call a friend. Give her a round of applause. Jay Goldmark, the farm manager at Stonehouse Farm. Give him a round of applause. Hey, Jay. And Bianca, Bianca Mobius Clune, the Climate and Soil Health Director at American Farmland Trust. Nice to have you all. Thank you so much. Um, Bianca, I, I do want to start with you because you know, uh, this discussion is really focused on a new meaning of agriculture, a new meaning of conventional agriculture. And I'm hoping you can explain what conventional industrial agriculture looks like today. Well, today what it looks like is all of the things we've just been talking about. Farmers are really struggling. They're not even really making a good business in a lot of cases. They're facing all of these weather extremes that we've been hearing about all morning. They're facing policy struggles. They can't necessarily get access to the EQIP program because it's not big enough. They're struggling and we need that to change. We do need that to change. So, so yeah, when we're talking about reimagining, right? Right now, we have a conventional that there's there's a lot of climate, a lot of other environmental issues, right? Water quality issues um, and nutrition issues, and we're looking at this agriculture that doesn't get necessarily, for better or worse, it doesn't necessarily get everyone's respect. And so, I really like to talk about what, what we need to create is a new conventional that everybody respects because we all know that we're doing the things that we've been talking about here today that are the solutions, right? And not just create change in small ways, not right. just we're helping a farmer at a time, but we need the face of agriculture to change. Just like we changed from, you all probably didn't have cell phones in your pockets 20 years ago. At some point we didn't have refrigerators, at some point we didn't have electricity, but today we take those things for granted. Today those are normal. That's what we need to do with our agriculture, an agriculture where the soils, the foundation of our agriculture without which we can't grow food, we are managing those where they're no longer degrading, but we are regenerating, rebuilding our soils so that they are fully functional and they are taking in that water. When we get that extreme downpour, the water goes in anyway. No matter how fast it goes, we can do that. We can change the infiltration rates of our soils with these practices we've talked about to the point where all of that water goes in, all of that water gets stored in that sponge, it's available for those microbes that make the soil work. All of you who are here today, if you have any little bit of soil anywhere, I wanna tell you that you are a livestock owner. <laughs> They're microscopic because one handful of soil has more organisms in it than there are people on Earth. And they need habitat and they need food. And we need to take care of them because they take care of us. So whether you work with thousands of farmers or whether you just have a potted plant, you've got livestock, probably millions, probably billions, <laughs> right? And soil health management systems, regenerative agriculture, where we're maximizing cover, we're maximizing living roots for as much of the time as possible so that they're feeding those microbes. We're minimizing disturbance, biological, physical, chemical disturbance, and we're maximizing biodiversity. That's a soil health management system. That is regenerative agriculture. That needs to be the new normal. That needs to be what we see everywhere on the landscape. I mean, we're always gonna have some holdouts, right? There's sure, still sure. folks who don't have a cell phone in their pocket. Um, we're gonna have that, but if that becomes the new normal, the face of agriculture is that. We all know that we are supported by agriculture, we support agriculture. That's what we're looking for. Love it, Bianca. Thank you so much. Jay, yes, you can give her a round of applause. Jay, you're farming in the way that Bianca is describing, and it has so many benefits for the land, and, and we know that. We, Bianca just, you know, you're taking care of microorganisms, billions of them. You're, you're creating, you know, a really healthy land preservation system. But one thing that you, you talked to me about when we last spoke was that these practices also bring something to you, and, and that's joy. And can you talk about why that's so important? Yeah, sure. Um, first, uh, it's an honor to be up here, um, and uh, especially to follow Alice Waters. Mm -hmm. That was like, 
amazing to You're hear sitting this, in her chair. the sensory <laughs> the, the, the sensory details of uh, the deliciousness um, I mean the joy of farming right um, of, of being a farmer so much of it is looking at your fields uh, looking at the weather the clouds uh, livestock that you can and cannot see <laughs> um, yeah I mean being a farmer kind of you just you look at stuff and then the fields and the livestock and the animals tell you what to do there's a there's an intelligence that you tap into and there's like that's the meaningful work uh, I mean that's that's the kind of thing that catapults you out of bed in the morning and all the farmers I know have an insane work ethic um, they you know they work until you die typically um, and you're, there's never uh, a dull moment <laughs> um, never a vacation really <laughs> right, right. Um, so I, I think um, yeah, just to that, that sensory note, I mean, there's joy in diversity. In all these cover crops, it's like the splendor of biomass that suddenly <laughs> is shooting up from the soil, whereas normally maybe you just sprayed and killed everything out. And you think for the first time you can see what those microbes are doing, that the invisible becomes visible right. with the cover crops, and that's, that's awesome. And, and you're you're a young farmer, and I, I imagine yeah. you're young. You're young. <laughs> Believe me, you're young. Um, and and I feel like this is something that will encourage more young people to want to be on the land. Yeah, Can absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, when you're young, you're creative and you question everything, right? I mean, that's the point of being young, uh, and think that you can do things different than your parents. Um, and as a parent, you you encourage your your children to to do those things, um, and so I think as the young as the next generation of farmers is com coming up, absolutely question everything that's being done and find your own inner inner motivation for being on the farm, or finding a farm, and when you add diversity and cover crops and start to manage your own nutrients on the farm, that's self sustainable, that's self reliance, and it feels exciting that you're in the driver's seat. Um, and you become an artist, and being a farmer is an artist. Absolutely. And I, I don't hear that as much. I love what Alice Waters said, too, that, that that's, there's an artistry in growing food, uh, and I think we need to get back to that. I love it. Being a farmer is an artist. Give that a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Caitlin, I want to shift gears with you a little bit. I'm wondering what kinds of programs retailers like Whole Foods can encourage Farmers to to uh, uh, you know adapt and and start utilizing these regenerative practices and and get that joy that Jay mm. has so much of because that makes food taste better. <laughs> it totally does. Uh, thank you for for having me here today. And I have to say, Jay, it's great to be on the stage with a farmer today as we talk about keeping farmers on land. Um, I just really appreciate you being here and. Um, yeah, it's really all about you today. So keep us honest when we're up here, okay? <laughs> um, you know, I want to tell a, a quick story. Um, I was in Iceland this summer. We got to look at, um, uh, visit a couple farms with a group from Whole Foods. Um, and we visited a dairy farm with Icelandic Provisions, um, one of our uh, suppliers in store. And uh, we met a, that five generations of farmers, which is incredible, yeah. um, dairy farming. And um, we were so excited to, visit with this group focused on sustainability and um, ask ask this farmer um, with a translator um, all about his climate smart and sustainable practices you know leading the way and how important it was and um, you know he, he he looked and and uh, when we asked this very important question and uh, seemed to be answering um, you know something uh, very knowledgeable and the translator just said you know, Climate smart is just common sense. It's just kind of common Duh. sense <laughs> agriculture. Uh, it's not about fancy words. Right. It's not about um, you know something uh, we're doing uh, intentional because it's sustainable. We're doing it because it's the right thing for the farm, for the land, for the animals. I want us to get to that place. Yeah. So when we talk about the new conventional, I want to sort of strip out the elitism of climate yeah. smart ag. Yeah. I want to strip out the sort of uh, partisan politics around something right like regenerative or yep. organic and get back to the joy and the beauty and the importance of farming uh, because it's the right thing to do for the land and the animal and the people. And so for me, um, I think about what Whole 
Foods can do. I think about uh, some of the barriers in the way. Um, we know for sure part of it is a commitment, right? A contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So someone like a Whole Foods can help support um, through commitments and contracts. Uh, once we have that commitment and contract, we know capital. Sometimes it is more expensive right, right. to start fi farming in climate smart ways up front. Though we know resoundingly that um, suppliers who farm regenerati regeneratively and organically um, have more profitability in the long run, which is really important. So it's a shift of business model that a earlier capital can help. So we have programs like the local loan producer program um, and our LEAP program, right, right, to try and get folks uh, involved. And then something, and Jay, keep me honest, is also community, right? Um, we get to serve as a connective tissue. If you think about half a million products on our shelves around the world, um, how do we connect those folks who are doing some of this work? So um, I know you have Jamie Agar coming right, on Friday. Right. Um, some other, yeah, some people know him. Uh, really incredible farmers. How do we connect folks so that that art and the joy, farming is kind of lonely sometimes, right? You're on the land a lot. Um, and even though you have billions of, uh, you know, microbes, et cetera, <laughs> to keep you company, um, I think a farmer's company is really important. So community can be that other way that we can help. Absolutely. And it seems so common sense, doesn't it, Jay, to have that community so that you can share knowledge and learn from one another. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most farmers, especially um, in the Midwest, of course, you're a long ways from anywhere. Um, so it is lonely business. And I think the idea of being connected through a common mar um, a market, like if, if I knew other farmers that sold the Whole Foods and then their friends and families saw their product on the shelf, like yeah. there's so much uh, identity and pride yeah. in being seen. And so much, especially as farmers, um, don't have a direct marketplace if, if you're not a small vegetable farm, but you're a large commodity grain farm. Your, your product is perhaps getting exported overseas and you don't have that same identity mm -hmm. in your community. Mm -hmm. So I think having that commitment for a market and being seen in your community is, is like it's worth more than gold. Absolutely. And, and Caitlin, Whole Foods can help farmers in local communities be seen more by sort of featuring them in their stores, right? Absolutely. I think storytelling, again, like um, getting back to the simplicity of like joy and storytelling, et cetera. I mean, I think um, we we try and storytell all the time. We have a phenomenal video crew, which I, honestly, sometimes the productions that they put out, I'm like, how has this not won some sort of documentary <laughs> award? Um, but how do we uh, show the story of the farmer? Um, you know, Jay was saying just before this, like, ooh, we need a little hope up there, right? Like, it's pretty grim out yep, there around yep. farmers and farming. Uh, you don't need me to list the statistics. So the more we can show it, show the joy yep. um, and the connectivity and connect folks around farming, the better. And, um, you know, I hope that's the feeling you get when you walk into a Whole Foods, right? You can feel that joy of, beauty of food um, and all of the pride that Jay spoke of that goes into that food when you're on the shelves. It's a pretty magical place, if you ask me. It really is. Bianca, I want to go back to you know what we were talking about a little bit earlier today. There are policy levers that can be in place to, to support farmers, to help them experiment, to help them knowledge share, to help them have the joy that we've been talking about. Can you, you identify what some of those policy levers might be and, and how we can support them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, while I was at USDA, we worked internally to implement soil health policies from instituting resource concerns so that NRCS conservation planners who implement EQIP along with partners like American Farmland mm -hmm. Trust, they can go out there, they can assess what's going on with soil health. They can actually see, okay, it's degraded, it's degraded in this way. We instituted soil organism habitat loss. Right. Right. as a resource concern right. so that it could be seen, identified with basic infield tools. And now we have planners on the ground at American Farmland Trust who are helping NRCS do that work. Um, so basics like that, the Farm Bill, of course, the conservation title that provided funding for EQIP and many other programs is one that was originally built by American Farmland Trust in coalition with a lot of partners so that now the, the USDA has been able to pay billions of dollars to farmers for voluntary incentive-based programs that help them implement these practices. Also, an RCS- That's a great program. Mm. Thank you, yeah, right, Jay, we talked about that, right? It's, it's a program that so many farmers have relied on. They provide 
grants. So for example, I run several soil health demonstration trial programs in both cover cropping and biochar. Mm -hmm. Getting those on the ground, helping farmers understand how to do that, and then rolling those lessons out. And those kinds of programs are critical for us to help farmers innovate, but have the support as they innovate. Um, we've also had a number of programs allowing us to, to build peer networks, training advisors with advanced soil health training so that we can put a whole crew of farmers like Jay out on the landscape who are in their local communities helping other farmers. Because like we've talked about here, right, it can be lonely. If you don't have a network of other farmers who are also transitioning, it can be really tough to go to the coffee shop and be the odd one out. We're herd animals. We really love to be together, <laughs> right? And so having a group of farmers, whether they're virtual or whether they're right there in your community and you can meet up in the coffee shop to discuss, hey, how's that working for you, right? Is it, is it working? What problems are you having? So that they have someone to build that, that thought leadership in their community with so that they have somebody to run those problems by, to have somebody to talk to about the fear of, gosh, if I do this, what's going to happen? Like, this, is, this is a farmer's business. This is their family's livelihood. Mm -hmm. And you don't just put your livelihood on the line if your kids your, and your family depend on it, right? So we have to be mindful of that as we're encouraging sure. farmers in this transition. So sure. putting Thanks peer Amanda. networks out there, right? It, a lot of our funding has come from USDA, and USDA has been amazing. Sure about allowing us to put those programs on the ground. Absolutely, Jay, please. I was going to echo that. I think farmers learn the most from each other. Like, we really watch what each other is doing. Yeah, yeah I think it's important, too, Danny, just to underscore that. Um, it, it, uh, it's critical that we rely on partners like AFT who are out in the field working, connecting farmers as well. Um, it's one thing for Whole Foods to say, like, we work with farmers and we support farmers. It's another thing to work with the folks who do it really, really right, well. So right. um, American Farmland Trust, National Young Farmers Coalition, Mad Agriculture, these are folks who are doing really important work um, and, and on the farm uh, with people that resonates more, as fun as it is for me to be on sure, a farm. Sure. Uh, it's way more important to have people with a technical um, ability and knowledge and connection uh, to connect farmers together, right? Agreed, agreed. Jay, we have uh, 30 seconds left, and I want you to have the final word. What do you want the people who are listening online and in the room to know about your work and, and what, what they should take away from this conversation? Wow, okay. Um, 30 yeah, seconds. So um, <laughs> I grew up on an 8,000-acre wheat and cattle ranch. Um, we used a lot of chemicals. We used a lot of synthetic nitrogen. We grew some amazing crops. I had, a, I had a lovely childhood and uh, moved back to the ranch and raised my daughter there. It was, it was utopia. Um, I ended up moving, and I learned a whole new way to farm in New York where it rains a lot more, so we can grow a lot of cover crops. And I realized there was a whole other back door to farming where you could grow cover crops upon cover crops mm -hmm. and, and be self-reliant in this nutrient cycle. And it opened up the door to just this kind of free fall way of farming where um, you start to adapt to the weather and the cover crops are there to help sequester carbon and nutrients and you have livestock you add to the farm. Suddenly you have a, a much larger staff than you ever thought you'd have and it, it becomes fun and dynamic and community and you have local markets. I don't know how to replicate that. I think I am incredibly lucky um, to have discovered this but I just, I. I wish we all could tap back into that, that sense of farming. I don't care what kind of farmer you are, but like we grow good, healthy food. You're a farmer, um, and it doesn't matter if you're organic or regenerative or conventional or new conventional. I think to tap back into that ancient knowledge of farming is what the goal is. What a beautiful point to end on. Thank you, Jay. That was perfect. That was perfect. Thanks to all of the panelists. It was a great conversation. Thank you all.